I'm, uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to preach God's Word. Pastor Jeff, if you're watching, which I know you are, thank you for the opportunity to try to fill <laughs> big shoes and, and for sharing your pulpit so generously. Um, we hope you have a wonderful vacation and you get to rest because you deserve it. You work hard. Thank you for serving us. Church, can we thank Pastor Jeff for serving us so faithfully? I feel very honored. Um, I feel very honored to get an opportunity to encourage you from the Word of God and uh, I use the word encourage intentionally because I believe a lot of us in this room or those of you watching online, a lot of us need encouragement right now. Raise your hand if you could use some encouragement tonight. Yes, and if you're in the chat, say me. I could use encouragement right now. It's been, it's been quite the year. It's been a long year, hasn't it? Do you remember March 2020 when it all started? It feels like forever ago. It's been a long, long year. And some of us I know for a fact some of us are running out of steam. Some of us are running on fumes. Some of us have hit the wall, so to speak. Some of us have been tested in ways that we could never imagine. And no, I'm not talking about tested for COVID. Like tested, tested, right? Although some of you have been tested for COVID. So. Maybe though, some of you tonight really seriously are at your rope's end, wondering how much more you can take. Some of you are on the ver verge of giving up, of throwing in the towel, of calling it quits, maybe on your faith, maybe on your family, maybe in your job, maybe in a long-standing fight against temptation, you're just ready to say, it doesn't matter, I'm just going to go for it. Or maybe some of you, even on life itself, you're thinking about giving up. And if you're ready to quit tonight, I pray that the Word of God would encourage you to endure, that you would see that this present pain will be worth the future reward. And so if you have your Bibles or you have your phones, please open with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. And as you turn there, let's pray together. Oh God, we thank you that we can gather in our weakness and our frailty and hear your word. Where we're tired, Lord, give us strength. Where we're empty, Lord, fill us afresh. In our weariness, encourage us. And where we feel like giving up, Lord, help us endure. Encourage us by your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Eyes on the prize. Eyes on the prize. You've heard that phrase before, right? Eyes on the prize. It's what athletes say when the training gets hard. It's what keeps them motivated when they have to do another round of push-ups or sprint up another set of stairs. Eyes on the prize. It means they're playing for the trophy. They're playing to win. The prize is what helps them endure. Keeping the future in focus helps them persevere through the present pain. And this is not just a principle for athletes. This is a principle for every Christian in the hearing of my voice right now. That keeping the future in focus helps us persevere through the present pain. Keeping the future in focus helps us persevere through the present pain. Jesus knew this secret the apostles all knew it, and you and I need to know it if we're going to endure through the trials, tribulations, and temptations of this life. And not just endure them, but to find joy in the midst of them. How many of you would love to be able to say, I have joy in the midst of my difficulties? How many? I would, definitely. Well, I believe God's word will show us how. And we're going to actually be looking at not just this one passage I told you to turn to, but three parallel passages tonight. And it's risky, I know, for my first time preaching, but I do think it'll pay off for us. And so if you're at 1 Peter 4, let's read verses 12 and 13 together. And then we'll look at two other passages, which I'll have all three of them up on the screens. So 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13 says this. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Now take your hand and flip two pages or three pages back, a couple pages back to chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 6 and 7, which say this. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it's tested by fire, might be found to result in praise and glory and honor when? At the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
And lastly, we're going to look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1. We all know these verses really well, but uh, let's just hone our hearts in on them just for a second. It says this, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So three different passages, but they're all really saying the same thing. What do they have in common? What are they saying to us tonight? Well, if you look at them, just even for a few minutes, you can, you can see that they follow a very similar formula. They say something along the lines of, Rejoice, because if you endure, your trial will work for your good. Rejoice, because if you endure, your trial will bring you benefit. Rejoice, because if you endure, the pain will serve a positive purpose. Or your burden will bring you a blessing. Your burden will bring you a blessing, both now and forever. Or to say it simply, trials can result in something positive for us. Trials can benefit, benefit us, and pain can be positive. Now, I say pain can be positive because our response to the pain, our response to the trial, will directly affect the outcome that we receive. The trial will either work for us or against us. We will either benefit from the trial or we won't. The outcome is dependent on our response. If we give up, we lose. If we endure, we win. And my prayer tonight is that by the time we're done, you will commit anew to enduring, to persevering, to pressing on, that you will let your trial transform you, that whatever you're facing, you will respond rightly to it, that the pain might produce something positive. Just like working out is painful, just like dieting is painful, just like surgery is painful, just like tightening up your budget can be painful, the pain produces a positive outcome that you will be grateful for. And that positive outcome is the prize. And by keeping your eyes on the prize, it will help you push past the pain. So what we're going to do tonight is we're just going to look at the texts. We're going to make some observations about these three passages. And we're going to see what they teach us about trials, about why we need to endure, and about how to endure with joy. So let's look at the texts together. Up on the screens, you'll see all three passages. Kind of looks like Neapolitan ice cream, doesn't it? So if you look at the structure, you'll notice they all have a similar structure, but they also have a similar vocabulary. So specifically, there are four words that they all share in common. The first word is trial. Everybody say trial. Good job. Let's try it again. First word is trial. There you go. Awesome. The second word is testing. Everybody say testing. The third word that they all have in common is may. Everybody say may. Not like the month, like might, like maybe, like possibly. Right? And then the last word that they all have in common is rejoice. Your turn. There you go. Good job. So we're going to look at each of these four words tonight in turn. Let's start with the first word on our list, which is trial. Trial. What do these three passages that we just read teach us about trials? Well, I believe they teach us a few things. Number one, they teach us that trials are varied. If you look at 1 Peter 6 or James chapter 1, verse 2, They say various kinds, trials of various kinds, okay? And I think we all know this intuitively, that trials come in many shapes and sizes. They come in various forms and in different ways. Sometimes they're staggered, hitting us like a set of waves, breaking relentlessly one after another. Sometimes they're stacked up on top of each other and they smash into us like a double-decker bus in London. I've never been to London, but I'm just imagining. And sometimes uh, they sneak up slowly like the rising tide, and other times they crash in unexpectedly like a raging tsunami. And trials vary between people, and they even vary within different seasons of your own life. And you know that. You might be struggling with your health, and the person next to you might be struggling in their finances. In your 20s, you might be struggling with loneliness. In your 40s, you might be struggling in your marriage. And every season has its own unique challenges. Each person is going through their own unique trial. And don't minimize someone's pain because it doesn't look like yours. What may seem small to you feels like a mountain to them. So let's be kind and gracious and helpful people to one another, knowing that everyone is struggling with something. And though trials are hard, the fact that they are unique and varied shows us the fingerprints of a loving God. He does not treat all his kids the same. 
But just like a good father, he treats us as individuals. Aren't you glad about that? Just like a good doctor he treats each of his patients differently, so God also designs and assigns unique treatments for the sin sicknesses that we have in our hearts. The various trials are sent for various purposes, and God is the designer and designator of them all. And here's the encouraging thing about this. He will never give you something that you can't handle. Nothing is happening to you that first hasn't passed through the hands of a sovereign, wise, all-powerful God. He has designed your unique trial to accomplish a unique and specific purpose. And he knows what kind of treatment we all need. So trials are varied. That's the first thing we learn. The second thing we learn is that trials are expected. You see this in 1 Peter 4.12, where Peter says, Why are you surprised? Why are you surprised that these trials are here? As if something strange were happening to you. In other words, this is totally normal. What you're going through is totally normal. Trials are a totally normal part of the human experience. If you're still breathing, expect to be struggling. And if you're still struggling, it means that God's not finished with you yet. Amen? He's still working on you. He's continuing to break off the rough edges and polish you into a masterpiece. You know, it's said that the great 15th century sculptor Michelangelo, the artist, not the Ninja Turtle, for you young people over there, okay, was asked about his masterpiece, the Statue of David. And the amazed fan approached him and asked, how in the world did you carve such a masterpiece out of such a crude piece of stone? And Michelangelo reportedly replied, oh, it was easy. All I did was chip away everything that didn't look like David. All he did was chip away everything that didn't look like David. Chip away, chip away. And so don't be surprised that God is still chipping away at you. Until he's done carving something beautiful out of that rough piece of stone called our lives, you'll keep receiving blows from the hammer and the chisel. Until he decides that you're fully baked and it's time to take you home to heaven, you can expect that trials will come in this life. What did Jesus say? He said, in this world, you will have trouble. Not you might have trouble, you will have trouble. And I'm sure you've heard this phrase, but something like this, uh, there's one thing certain in life, you're either in a trial, coming out of a trial, or about to go into a trial, right? It's like trials are coming sooner or later. And if the Almighty Son of God suffered when he was on the earth, we should expect to suffer too. And you might be saying, Alex, this is not encouraging me at all, and I'm sorry, but it's what the Bible says. And I think the, the good thing we can learn about expecting trials is that when you do learn to expect trials, when they do come, you aren't caught off guard. When you're expecting them, you aren't devastated by them. You're prepared for them. You know they're coming. Your feet are planted. It's just a matter of when. And so, you know, expect trials, know that they're going to come, and don't be knocked off your feet when they do. Now, again, that might seem a little negative, but the last two are, are more positive. So here's a, another thing we learn about trials from these passages, and that is trials are temporary. Everybody say, trials are temporary. And everybody say, amen. amen. Praise God. So Peter says in, the, in 1 Peter 1.6, though now for a little while, just for a little while, you're grieved by various trials. Trials are temporary. And listen, I get it. I know that when we're in the middle of a trial, it's easy to lose sight of that fact that trials are temporary. But the truth is, trials come for a season to accomplish a purpose. They come for a season to accomplish a purpose. They come and they go. They don't last forever. But when things are hard, it can seem like it's always going to be that way. My kids are always going to be difficult. My marriage is always going to be unfulfilling. My husband is always going to be insensitive. My finances are always going to be lacking. My job is always going to be hard. I'm always going to be stuck in this neighborhood. I'm never going to find a spouse. Can you relate? When we're in a trial, it's easy to lose perspective. Have you lost perspective in the middle of your trial? Are you afraid it's going to be this way forever? I was recently counseling uh, a friend, a man that I know, and he was sharing that his marriage was in a dark and difficult season right now. And it, he was saying that it feels like it's always been this way, and I'm afraid it's always going to be that way. And he was thinking, maybe, maybe I should just count my losses, cut the cord, and try again somewhere else with someone else. And listen, I know those feelings. I had those feelings at one point in my own marriage. And I told him this little-known statistic that most marriages actually go through a rough patch at around year seven. It's called the seven-year itch. You can look it up. It's like 
scientifically kind of verified. Um, but the interesting thing about the researchers who studied that is that they found that the people who identified their marriages as difficult, if those couples didn't divorce, within just three years, they went from calling their marriage difficult to exceedingly happy. 90% of those couples went from my marriage is difficult to I have a happy, healthy, vibrant marriage. 90%. If they just held on through the difficult season. And that's my testimony as well. My wife and I hit a, a, a rough patch around our seven-year mark, and it was hard. I mean, it was really hard. And it felt like it was going to go on forever. You know, it, when you're in the middle of it, you lose perspective and you think this is how it's going to always be. But that was eight years ago, y'all. So God healed and restored and blessed, and we're in a totally different place now. The storm blew through and the sunny skies returned. The trial is temporary. And you might find yourself in a season of sickness or a season of financial struggle or a season of depression. And whatever season you find yourself in, my encouragement to you is to remember, it's a season. And seasons change. The trial you're facing, it will pass. Amen? The season you're struggling through, it will be over one day. And you will transition into a better and brighter period. Psalm 126 says, He who goes out weeping will come home rejoicing. And Psalm 30 says, Weeping endures for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in the morning. The day will come when your trial will be over and you'll be in a better and brighter future. And honestly, even if that future is heaven. When you remember your trial is temporary, you know you can hang on long enough to get through it. So don't lose hope. Your trial is temporary. The last thing we learn about trials from the, these passages is that trials are necessary. Trials are necessary. First Peter 6, he says, If necessary, God will grieve you with the trial for a time. Meaning, the trial has a purpose. There's purpose for the pain. God is not just some cruel, sadistic torturer. No, like a good surgeon, he's wounding to heal. Just like the forest needs a fire in order to flourish, our souls need trials in order for God to burn away all that will keep us from him. And two times in these passages, Peter uses the word fire. What does fire do? What does fire do? Fire burns away anything that's not permanent. Fire burns away anything of non-value. Fire leaves only what is valuable. And Paul says, in the end, only three things will remain, faith, hope, and love. And so when God sends you a trial, he's burning away everything that will keep you from being faithful, hopeful, and loving. God is purifying you through the trial. You know, gold is only refined in fire, and diamonds are only produced under pressure. You can't get pure gold without heat. You can't get diamonds without pressure. God is burning away things in your life that shouldn't be there, things in your life that won't last, things in your life that are not of value, things in your life that won't go with you into eternity, things in your life that are keeping you, honestly, from God's best for you. There is a purpose for this trial. It is necessary, and God wants to produce something in you. And pain is a very effective tool to do that. Pain does a couple things. It motivates and it moves. Pain motivates and it moves. It's often the only thing that we'll actually respond to. Like sometimes he needs to get the prod out and just poke us in the ribs, you know, to get our attention. It forces us to move and discomfort causes us to change. How many of you know C.S. Lewis? Raise your hand or in the chat say, yes, I do. Okay, we all love C.S. Lewis. If you don't know him, you should buy all of his books and read them. Um, but in The Problem of Pain, C.S. Lewis said this, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. Pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf and dying world. So ask yourself in your trial, what is God pushing you to do through this pain? What does he want to transform through this trial? Maybe God wants to do something new in your life. Maybe he's trying to wake you up. Maybe it's time for a new job. Maybe he wants some of you to go back to school or enter into vocational ministry. Maybe he wants you to re-engage in your marriage or start actively discipling your children. Maybe he's asking you to leave that sinful relationship. What is God trying to do in you? Why is this trial necessary for you? Because the scripture says this trial is necessary. It's not for nothing that God is afflicting you. He's trying to motivate and move you. And if, here, here's an encouragement. If you know 
what God has been showing you and what he's been telling you and what he's been asking you to change and what he's been asking you to start or to stop or to do differently, if you know what that thing is, my best advice to you is do it. Obey tonight, tomorrow. Like, don't delay, obey. Hey, that's pretty good, huh? So, so God has a purpose for your pain. Trials are necessary. Those, those are the four things we learn about these texts um, from, about trials. So they are varied, they are expected, they are temporary, and they are necessary. Now let's look at the second repeat word, which is testing. Testing. Everybody say testing. testing. Good job. All right, all three of these passages refer to trials as times of testing. And when God sends you a trial, he's testing you. He's trying to prove you. Think about it. What is testing? What is testing? Well, testing reveals what is actually there. Testing reveals what is actually there. When you give someone a test at school, you find out what knowledge they actually have. They're either going to get an A or an F, hopefully an A. And all the other letters in between, I skipped those, sorry. But testing reveals what was there all along. It doesn't change what was there, it just reveals what was there. Testing proves what is inside. And that's scary. Would you want someone to know what's inside of you? I don't, I don't. But what's inside of you spills out when we're bumped. That's what trials do. They reveal what has been inside of us all along. Crisis reveals character. Crisis reveals character. And COVID has been a big crisis for many of us. And it's revealed a lot of people's true colors, hasn't it? For some of us, our character flaws came to the surface this past year, haven't they? I know mine have. Being home all day with the kids, navigating Zoom school, seeing more of your spouse than usual, maybe if you're a teen teenager, just being isolated from your friends, or maybe if you're a child listening, maybe there's kids at home running around in the background and you hear my voice. You're just sick of being home all day. You miss school, you miss the park, you're ready to explode, right? All these trials have been brought to the surface, or all these, all these issues have been brought to the surface that otherwise would have remained hidden inside. God brings things to the surface because he wants to deal with them. God brings things to the surface because he wants to deal with them. Do you remember the man with the withered hand in the, in the gospel stories? So he's, he's in this house, Jesus is teaching, and Jesus sees the man with the withered hand. And what does he say to the man with the withered hand? He says, hey, stretch out your hand, yes, in front of everybody. Stretch out your diseased and deformed hand. Stretch out your area of weakness and let me heal it. And he's saying the same thing to you and to me. What God reveals, he means to heal. And God revealed the areas of brokenness in your life because he wants to deal with them. He wants to heal them. The sin, the selfishness, the lust, the greed. What he reveals, he means to heal. So my encouragement to all of us tonight is don't turn, don't run, don't hide, but lean into that and let God begin working on those things. Let him heal your areas of weakness. Now, for some of us, the testing revealed not just areas of weakness, but areas of idolatry. In this year, God exposed a lot of our idols. Maybe we trusted in our jobs or our work ethic or our skill sets, and yet we lost our job. Maybe we trusted in the size of our savings account, and it's drained. Maybe we trusted in our political party of choice, and they lost. Maybe uh, our preference was in the style of church. Oh, great, they're meeting outside. Oh, great, they're meeting online. Oh, great, they're meeting inside. Right? Or maybe, maybe for me, I think the idol that God revealed, he probably revealed a few of them this year, but he revealed that my idol is comfort. I want things to be comfortable and easy. And God took all that away. Not because he's mean, but because he's good. Because he's revealing where we had falsely put our confidence. He doesn't want us to be put to shame. And so he let our idols crumble to the ground. Like fire purifying the impurities from gold, he's purifying Christians who turn towards him in testing. He's getting rid of the things that aren't supposed to be in our lives and our hearts. Now, those are all negative, but maybe for some of you, the test results were positive. And again, no, I'm not talking about the COVID tests, right? The test results during this trial, the things that came to light, God shined a spotlight into your heart and the things that came out were positive. And you can say like, King David says in Psalm 17, you have probed my heart, God. You have visited me by night. You have tested me and you will find nothing. Wow. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. 
And this time of testing for some of you has revealed positive things. Things like a heart after God, a hunger for his word, a desire for purity, a commitment to his church, a passion for the lost, a renewed spiritual interest. If those were the things that got revealed in this time for you, praise God. That's amazing. That just, it, it proves what was there all along. The testing proved that you have a heart that's turned towards the Lord, towards the Lord in trust and in faith. That is such an amazing thing to see God reveal that. And we should praise God for those times of testing when he reveals a heart turned, turned towards him. Instead of falling away, like honestly many have in this time, you drew near. And that's beautiful. And it's super important because as we'll see in our next repeat word, how we respond during testing determines everything in the outcome. And so our third word tonight is may. May. Testing and trials do not automatically guarantee a good outcome. Just because you're going through a trial doesn't mean you will reap good fruit from it. I think all of the passages we looked at show us that. They all say may, meaning our response determines the results that we reap. Our response determines the results that we reap. So all three passages say may, which also means may not. It can or it cannot. It's possible, but it's also not possible. And what makes the difference between those two outcomes? Well, I'll tell you, our perseverance, our cooperation, and our endurance. If we give up, we lose. If we endure, we win. If we give up in the middle of the trial, we miss what God is trying to do in our lives. If we press in, if we persevere, we gain great and everlasting rewards. You know, the only runner who gets a prize is the one who actually finishes the race. And too many people give up before they finish. And you don't want to be like this guy. This guy right here. You don't want to be like this guy. Oh my gosh, he was so close. But so close doesn't count. He missed his reward by a few inches. So don't give up, family. Persevere, endure, endure. You know, as a worship team, we've been reading through the New Testament or trying to read through the New Testament together. And I've been struck at how often the New Testament authors use the word endure. I counted it this morning. I probably counted it wrong because there's probably other variations of the word. But I counted 47 times the word endure is used in the New Testament out of 27 books. That's, that's a pretty good amount. Why did the New Testament authors gravitate towards the word endure? Why was this word so important to them? Well, honestly, I think it's just because they knew that life is hard. Like, following Jesus is hard. Life hurts. It's messy. It's discouraging. It beats us down. And even the strongest and most stubborn of us can lose heart. And I think the biblical authors knew that. They're not naive. They knew we needed a lot of encouragement, so they wrote a lot. Keep going. Don't give up. It's worth it. Keep going. The writer to the Hebrews says this. He says, You have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. You have need of endurance. How many of you need endurance right now? Say, I need endurance. Say, God, give me endurance. Lord, we need it. We need you to help us endure. We need to endure. Why? Because our endurance matters. It matters to your own salvation. Jesus said, he who endures to the end will be saved. Your endurance matters to your marriage. Remember you promised, till death do us part. It matters to the faith of your children. They're watching you. Your endurance matters to your church family, for we are all parts of one body. It even matters to your physical life. It's no secret that suicide has skyrocketed during the pandemic. And I just want to say, if there's anyone out here in the sanctuary or watching online who has been contemplating taking your own life, I just want to encourage you, please do not. God does not want you to. We don't want you to. You are loved by the creator of the universe. You are loved, and he deeply desires to have a relationship with you and to, to walk this life with you. He has plans for you to fulfill. He has things for you to accomplish on the earth. He wants you to make a difference, and you are needed. You're needed to this church family. You're valuable, you're a contributor to the kingdom of God. 
The church needs your gifts, not your financial gifts. We need your, your, your gifts and who you are and your heart and your personality and everything you bring to contribute to what God wants to do in the world in this generation. You matter. So my encouragement to any of you struggling is please do not give up. Please don't do that. Yes, there's pain right now, but joy comes in the morning. So steady on, endure. And for all of us, the stakes are too high to give in, to throw in the towel, to quit. Again, your response determines the results that you reap. You may or may not receive the reward from this trial. And so we need to respond rightly when things are tough. We need to press in. We need to endure. Or as Paul says, we need to fight the good fight, keep the faith, finish the race. Or in the words of Journey, don't stop believing. Sorry, I had to. That was just too easy. But really, don't stop believing, family. Don't stop believing. And that leads us to our final repeat word for the night. And this really gets to the heart of the passages and to the heart of our message tonight. And that fourth word is rejoice, rejoice. But the question for us is, why should we keep believing? And even more, why should we rejoice when things are hard? And the answer, like all things, is found in the text. And that answer is because eternity is real and it's right around the corner. In 1 Peter 1.6, which we read, it says, in this you rejoice. In this you rejoice. In what, Peter? In what? In this. Well, if we would have read verses 1 through 5, it would have given us the context. In this is the certain, incredible salvation that's right around the corner for us. In that we rejoice. That salvation that is more glorious than we can imagine and so close we can taste it. We rejoice because heaven is real and it's going to be so good. It's going to make our temporary trials seem like child's play. And we can handle anything that life will throw at us because we're going to get paradise with God forever. And when you know something good is coming, you can endure anything. When you know something good is right around the corner, you can endure anything. My kids, they can clean the whole house. I mean the whole house, if it means that they get to play with their friends down the street. You can stand in line for two hours at Disneyland if it means you get to go on the new Star Wars ride. Right, Mikey? You can endure a 14-hour plane ride if it means you get to stand on a tropical sandy beach or embrace a long-lost loved one. And women, you guys are heroes. You endure the most excruciating pain of labor called childbirth because it means you will get to soon hold your sweet newborn baby and look into their eyes. Eyes on the prize helps us push through the pain. And the pun's not intended about the pregnancy thing, by the way. Eyes on the prize helps us push through the pain. The prize is worth the pain. The, the prize makes fighting for it, allows us to push through the pain. James, Peter, those are the books we read. Did you know those, both of those authors were killed for their faith? James was killed with the sword. Peter, it said, was crucified upside down, both because they refused to deny the Lord. What were they thinking when they were being tortured? What were they thinking when they were in agony and pain at that death's door? Lord, you're so worth it. You're so worth it, Lord. I can't wait to see you. I can't wait to be with you in glory. Receive me into paradise. I'm coming, Lord. Their future focus carried them through their present pain. How about Paul? How could he endure shipwrecks, floggings, imprisonments, starvation, stonings, and ultimately beheading? Because in 2 Corinthians 12, we learn that Paul was actually taken up to heaven, probably when they left him for dead outside of the city. And while he was in heaven, he had seen and experienced things too glorious to be expressed, too beautiful, too wonderful, too perfect. And Paul had tasted and seen what's coming to every believer. And it was too good to give up on. No way, I am not giving up on that. It was too good. He had to get it. Nothing would stop him from getting heaven. Eyes on the prize. Eyes on the prize. And then Jesus, our ultimate example, 
who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame. And now he is seated at the right hand of God in glory. Jesus had his eyes on the prize. The joy of what awaited on the other side of the cross allowed him to endure its excruciating pain and the full fury of of God's righteous wrath against our sin and our wickedness. What was it that awaited him on the other side of the cross? How could he endure such pain? What was the joy that was set before him? It was eternity with you. It was eternity with me. His joy was to glorify the Father by saving us. Heaven with us was his prize. And now for us, heaven with him is our prize. And if you're here or you're watching online and you don't know Jesus, you don't have the hope of heaven. You don't have the prize that will sustain you through the many various trials that you will face in this life. You don't have the thing to motivate you to keep going when life is hard if you don't have heaven. And there are pastors online in our chat or there will be pastors in our prayer room after service who would love to pray with you to receive Christ, just to simply pray and trust him and say, Jesus, I believe What you did on the cross, paying for the penalty of sin, was for my sin. And I believe, Jesus, that you paid for it all, completely. And I trust in you, and I believe that you rose from the dead, and I am ready to follow you. And if you trust Christ for salvation, you have that hope. And when we have that hope, especially the hope of eternity, we can endure the most grueling circumstances. And as Christians, if you're a Christian in this room, you do have that hope. You have certain hope. You have eternal hope. You have glorious hope. You have hope beyond your wildest dreams. And that's why we can rejoice in the midst of our suffering. That's why we can laugh in the face of our trials. Not because the pain isn't real, but because the hope of heaven far outweighs all of our sorrow. Or as the Apostle Paul says, our light is and momentary afflictions are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Light and momentary afflictions. Light and momentary. Temporary. I've been (laughs) walking through the cemetery near our house every morning around sunrise. I know it sounds creepy, but it's actually quite beautiful and peaceful. Everybody there is very quiet. But it's nice. I get to talk to the Lord. And you look at the tombstones, 80 years, 60 years, 39 years, 12-year-old, sometimes less than that, and then eternity, eternity. This life's pretty short. We can endure because eternity is forever, and it's amazing. And one day the sorrows of this life will be over They will be swallowed up in the ever-expanding joy, delight, and pleasure of God's love. That is our hope, family. That is our reason for enduring. That is our reason for rejoicing in our temporary trials. Because one day, one day, every sorrow and sadness will be completely eclipsed in light so beautiful that the former things will be remembered no more. Before James was killed with the sword, he wrote, this passage to encourage the persecuted and scattered church. And he also wrote it to encourage us. And he says this, Blessed is the man or woman who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, so you have to stand, family, you have to stand. When he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. So keep your eyes on the prize. Don't lose focus, don't lose heart, don't lose hope, rejoice, endure. It will be so worth it. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Father, we, uh, we need your help. Life is hard. Life is messy. People are hurting. And I just pray, Lord, for every tired soul either watching online or listening in the room. Lord, you know what we need. Strengthen us by your spirit. Help us to walk with you in obedience to you for the long haul. Lord, help us to run the race you've set for us and help us to finish it.
Help us not give up or lose hope, Lord. We thank you that it'll be so worth it, and we can't wait to see you. We pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. amen.